Hey everyone, and welcome to part one of a two-part series on the space industry. We are privileged to be joined for this roundtable discussion by two experts in the area who have deep knowledge of the relevant players and their technical capabilities. These are Joseph from the Terran Space Academy YouTube channel, which you should definitely check out if you have not already, and investor and space industry veteran Paul Tomko. We hope this conversation will be a good primer both on the current state of the industry as well as the larger opportunity which we think may develop over time. Without further ado, here is part one of our Space Industry Roundtable conversation. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on our Good Soil Investment uh, Roundtable discussion to talk thing, all things space, space industry related. We've uh, recruited uh, Joseph here who runs a pretty um, interesting uh, YouTube channel that I've started following recently. Joseph, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about the Terran Space Academy uh, space channel a bit? Absolutely. We started the Terran Space Academy because like a lot of people, we love space science. And I've been studying science and space science pretty much all my life. But until recently, it was not that easy to make a living in space science. So it had to be almost a hobby. Um, I had served in the United States Marine Corps and then the United States Air Force, including the Strategic Air Command and then later U.S. Space Command, where I was uh, an ICBM commander with Minuteman II ICBMs. Mm -hmm. And I had started working on uh, a master's degree in aerospace science and then got accepted for medical training. But I decided to go back in about 2014 and complete uh, a master's degree in space science and then a certificate in astrobiology. So I have been steeping myself in space science for about almost a decade now, isn't it? That's amazing. Um, wow. But realistically, since I was a little kid watching Star Trek, you know, mm -hmm. we only had three channels. So <laughs> I love this stuff and I love that the industry has now gotten to where we can speak realistically about some of these things that have just been aspirations for the last five decades. Yeah, they've been science fiction and now it's becoming more of a reality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for the intro, Paul. We also recruited Paul Tomko, who uh, he actually, uh, you know, I'd heard of Rocket Lab in the past, but I think it was January, February. Paul sent me some really interesting, um, you know, uh, messages and notes on on uh, Rocket Lab and Peter Beck that really made me more in inquisitive and curious. Up till then, I'd been just known mostly about SpaceX and so forth. But, uh, you know, I, it turned my eyes open to other space companies that could become successful in time. And um, so, Paul, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit about your background in, in this stuff? Sure. Yeah. So my my official degree is in aerospace engineering, and I worked at the National Reconnaissance Office for three years working on satellite development as a program manager. Then I did a like a five, six year stint where I was doing business development. So I got more into investing. That's where I, I found Emmett and his uh, wise sage advice on using options and all these other things this last year and uh being a huge tesla bull of course you do a lot of study on elon musk and his companies and as an investor you're always looking for that next kind of spacex if one exists where is it and with virgin galactic going public uh what two years ago and then rocket lab and you have astra merging with specs there's uh you see a lot more companies come to the scene and using kind of the Elon Musk approach of first principles, you analyze these companies and see if there's really a good investment here or not. So when I saw Rocket Lab, then I reached out to Emmett as a kind of a courtesy because I learned so much from you already from your conversations with Dave. And uh, yeah, here we are. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad uh, we're chatting about it. I mean, Matt and myself, we're obviously novices on all things space. You know, we understand a little bit about the investing world and buying and selling stocks or options but in terms of like the mechanics of rocketry and satellites and um you know orbital services we're you know pretty green you know like we we've read up on stuff uh, but we haven't worked with it with our hands like some of you guys have done some of that um we haven't studied it as astutely as you guys have um with your channel joseph especially um, so we're just here to all learn and hopefully open source our learning about this with our community who's interested. Um, so, I mean, I, the one thing I wanted to, I thought we could start with is like the total addressable market for the space industry as this decade progresses, you know, like up till now, we were just talking as we were about, we we're about to go live, Joseph, about like, what were you saying about Virgin Galactic and like 
miss, you know, there's a lot more stuff coming to fruition now than, than people realize. Yes, there, there are a lot of companies out there that have some very good technology. Um, understanding the technology behind the company is vital to knowing whether or not to invest in it. I, I hate to beat up on someone who's having a bad day, but the founder of Nikola, Nikola, the, the truck, the, the hydrogen powered truck. Yeah. How he got billions of dollars of investment money without someone checking with a high school physics teacher and saying, hey, is it hard to make hydrogen? And they could say, well, you've got to superheat steam and then hit methane with it. It's not carbon neutral, right? And you can do yeah. electrolysis, but then you're losing 30% of your electricity, whereas you could just put that in a battery pack and save 90% of the electricity. So it, it didn't make a lot of sense. The infrastructure wasn't there for the hydrogen, but they got billions of dollars. So understanding mm -hmm. the technology behind a company, no matter how good their CGI is, and, and the CGI yeah. was really good with that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the truck looked like it was driving. <laughs> this so angled the camera, yeah. But the basis of the technology, any anyone with a good understanding of physics, definitely Paul could, would look at that and tell you, where are you going to get the hydrogen? Yes, hydrogen is a wonderful fuel. But if you can't get the hydrogen affordably, then that's not going to work. With um, some of the rocket companies, you can you can look at the basis behind their technology. And, and I don't want to pick on anyone in the space industry, but I have seen companies pop up, get really good funding mm -hmm. with the dream. We're going to mine the asteroids. Yeah. I'm not saying with what? How will yeah. you get there? What's your plan? We'll work on that. They get millions of dollars and then they slowly fade away because if you don't have a practical way to make it real, you're not going to go anywhere. So the, the space industry is becoming huge and there are there's an unbelievable potential right now. This is the gold rush of our time. This is, you know, the the California and uh, Canadian gold rush. Mm -hmm. And as in that gold rush, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money by investing in the wrong thing. You know, Conrad Hilton built hotels and ended up a billionaire. He didn't go dig yeah. for gold. He built a hotel where others wanted to dig for gold. Mm -hmm. Sometimes selling the shovel and providing a room is what really makes, you know, makes your money. The space industry will be the same thing. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so maybe that's a, a good intro to kind of this this broader total addressable market, um, and, and maybe starting to you know classify some of the different services that these companies are providing. So, you know, I think I think when most people think about space industry right now, you know, they tend to think of, of basically just rocket launch services. Uh, but then you've got also the Virgin Galactics of the world uh, and some of the stuff that Blue Origin was doing, which is where you're just kind of kissing space and then falling back. Um, maybe, you know, uh, Joseph or Paul, could you maybe just kind of uh, give an intro to what the different um, services or, you know, market segments within the space industry are today and, and maybe what they could be five, 10 years down the road? Do you want to hit a couple of them, Paul? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at what what uh, areas Rocket Lab is tackling, yeah, there's the launch business, but they're the first to admit that the launch business is really one of the smallest segments out there. Uh, space systems is a huge market and that includes you know they have like for example their satellite the photon satellite that they're launching and that allows interplanetary missions that allows testing of new technologies and uh, along those same lines in space systems you also have the components that they're building so i think they announced they're making a new reaction wheel line where they're manufacturing i think 2,000 reaction wheels a year which is amazing but that same that same philosophy flows into solar panels. It flows into star trackers, all these different components of satellites. Uh, they can sell and the margins are much higher than a launch business. And then you look at uh, the next phase, which is uh, space applications. So once you build this infrastructure uh, of a satellite constellation, then you have all this data that you can give to customers. And um, I mean, once the constellation is built, that data um, you can you can price it well and the margins are super high and that's really like the largest addressable market uh, on the tourism side of course you have what Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin was, do was doing uh, with New Shepard but um, I mean that is a market for sure people are 
willing to pay a lot of money for that as well. Um, I just don't know how much it scales into uh, other applications. Mm. Uh, Joseph, you want to hit any other topics that I missed? Um, no, you, you covered that well. Now, when we look at Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, those are almost, I hate to say it, but vanity projects for the billionaires that own them. They are mm. not going to get their investment back. Right. Hmm. Because there are not enough people with that much money. Tom Hanks was offered a ride on Blue Origin and yeah. he did a very funny skit saying twenty eight million dollars to basically do what I did, what I pretended to do in Apollo 13. That It's just, you know, and he's got two hundred million. So yeah. now Virgin Galactic is selling quite a few seats, so they will make some money and they are furthering the industry, which I fully support. Yes. But. If they really wanted to have a viable company that would make money, they would have to increase the efficiency of their rocket engine to the point that they can do point to point transfers, you know, point to point travel so that you could leave Los Angeles, cross over the Carmen line, land in, say, San Francisco, you know, or somewhere even farther, a 30 minute flight that would normally be three or four hours. Well, you could go to, from California to New York and and, you know, less than an hour, you know, yeah. using a ballistic arc like that. But the the efficiency of their rocket engine, the specific impulse, is not high enough to allow them to do that. But if someone were to develop that technology and they could they could work on improving the efficiency of their, you know, spaceship two, and it would have to be a spaceship three. But you would have a viable hypersonic transportation system that mm. would make, you know, the Concord look slow and everyone gets a little pair of ast uh, astronaut wings when they land. So you would have a viable, you know, you would have something that people would be willing to spend money for. And you've got to bring the price down yeah. to something that the average comfortable person could afford, right? Which is probably close to $100,000. Um, so these companies are doing quite a bit. Now, Blue Origin's not really doing as much as Virgin Galactic is. The Blue Origin price is just ridiculous. Um, yeah. they will have to bring it down considerably, even for millionaires to want to do it. Because look at this, I've got $28 million. Let's say you gentlemen have $28 million, all of us do. And so to spend, right? Yeah. We've, we invested in Tesla in 2011, we're feeling brilliant. And uh, we, um, we, we've got 25 million each to spend. We've got $100 million we're pooling together. Do we ride a Blue Origin capsule to the edge of space? A 20 minute flight for our $100 million for the four of us, or do we rent for $90 million? Do we get a SpaceX Dragon, spend three days in orbit, yeah. and crew astronauts at 500 kilometers, which is above the International Space Station? I don't think there's any question about it. If yeah. you have the money to do that, you're going to want that three days of looking out that window at the Earth, right? Yeah. So is that just a, is that a difference of rocket engine technology primarily the ability yes. to right? the new shepherd is a single stage to not orbit um system it is one tank one you know one engine actually and it's just going up it's not going laterally at all to mm -hmm. get into orbit you, you don't just have to go up yeah you have to go laterally at you know twenty seven thousand kilometers per hour so fast enough to so that you're falling at the same rate that your that gravity is pulling you toward the Earth, so you go into an orbit. The the Blue Origin rocket, um, the New Shepard, is completely incapable of anything like that. Mm. It just goes up, crosses the Kármán line, drops, and then you know the the rocket booster lands, and then the capsule comes down. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with Virgin Galactic. You know they've got a plane carrying it up, and you know just. 10 kilometers up, which is what, 33,000 feet, is above more than 90% of the atmosphere. So you're dramatically increasing the efficiency of your launch. But your rocket has to be small enough for a plane to take it up. Yeah. But yeah. once it launches, then it can go on up and it's got a longer flight than Blue Origin. It's a lot more fun. It takes about an hour altogether from when you take off to when you launch and then come back and glide and land. Um, you know they've had to delay because it didn't it didn't come down exactly where they wanted it to. That's one of the things about being in space without you know an, an orbital maneuvering system. Uh, you will come down wherever wherever you go up. If there's a slight 
perturbation to your flight as you're going up, there's not a lot you can do till you come back down. So, mm -hmm. so th that's one of the things that delayed things. But these are these are furthering, you know, the the sort of the civilian use of space, the commercial use of space, which is absolutely necessary for anything to be sustainable. If it doesn't make money, it won't keep flying. And mm -hmm. um, so the, they're helping in those regards. But realistically, there are hydrogen balloon capsules that you can sit in and have dinner. And they take you way up and you can see the curve of the earth and you can see the blackness of space and you're outside almost all of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And you're up there for an hour having dinner. That's, you know, people will, will be doing that also. That's something that's, that's uh, there's two companies that are working on that. So those are things that, that will be popular also. So a few people will ride on Virgin on, on uh, the uh, Blue Origin, New Shepard. More, I think, will ride on the Virgin Galactic, uh, Spaceship Two. But um, there's a lot more potential for people just to go up in a, in a hydrogen balloon, a, a yeah. super high altitude balloon. Um, would you would say, you say lower, Earth, lower Earth orbit is like just a completely different requirement of technology or a class of completely technology different. that needs you have needs. to have a multi-stage rocket and you're only going to get with your best rocket about four to five percent of your starting mass into orbit wow so it takes and a so, lot so right now spacex is the private company most of our followers are familiar with and then we're trying to get more familiar with rocket lab that seems to be the only two companies really successful other than the ULA, which, you know, is not the most efficient um, in terms of use of capital in our opinions, but in terms of like, you know, private companies that are up and coming, we kind of see SpaceX and Rocket Lab as the two primary ones successfully uh, uh, launching um, into lower earth orbit. Do you see uh, Joseph or Paul, any other kind of companies on the horizon kind of getting to that same level anytime soon? You hit one, Paul, and then I'll hit another one. Yeah, sure. So um, it's all relative when you say time soon. Um, mm. SpaceX has a huge lead. I mean, it's hard to compare these different companies because it's it's really uh, apples and oranges here. Um, yes. But they have at least a decade head start on most of these other companies, if not, if not more. If you look at what they did with Falcon 1, I mean, maybe more than a decade head start. Uh, then you have Rocket Lab coming at their heels. And even though maybe, you know, they're significantly behind SpaceX, they're really like the second clear um, uh, in second place. And behind Rocket Lab, I would have to put, um, there's a couple companies. You have Astra, so they're focused on uh, small launch as well, but their goal is daily launch. And they went public this year as well by merging with a SPAC. Uh, I think it was uh, Holicity was their, their SPAC merger. Mm -hmm. And um, they have potential for sure because they're so focused on daily launch and bringing down the cost of their rockets lower than it's ever been before. I mean, their goal is to have a rocket cost somewhere along the lines of half a million dollars, $500,000 is their goal, wow. which is mm -hmm. ridiculously low. I mean, I think Rocket Lab charges around seven million, five to seven million per electron launch. Um, other contenders out there are charging 10 million, 12 million. Uh, so Astra, if they can be successful, and they were really, really close to getting to orbit. They were only, I think, uh, 500 kilometers an hour short of orbital velocity. So they're really close. They have a couple launches coming up. Their launch window is actually open right now, same time as uh, Rocket Labs. Hmm. So if they can get to orbit, um, they do have a good team in place and they could potentially disrupt the small launch market. Of course, like we talked about, it's not just about launch. They're also focused on space services. They want to build a satellite bus platform as well. Um, but that is another player and I'll let Joseph take another one. Now he, he mentioned Astro, which I, I find uh, to be an interesting company. I want to draw your attention to the payload. These companies are getting to orbit rocket lab currently is about 300 kilograms. Yes. Astra is hoping for 500 kilograms. Uh, Firefly Aerospace is about 1,000 kilograms, right? Now, Rocket Lab is looking to build a bigger rocket so that they can get, you know, 10,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit. They're starting to get that they want to get to where they can compete with SpaceX. The problem with competing with SpaceX is they've been doing this for a decade and they're landing their rockets and using them again. 
So these companies are finding that they start wanting to serve the small sat community, but mm -hmm. realize that it's almost as expensive to make a little rocket as it is a big one. So they may as well make a big one. Now this, the SpaceX um, Falcon 9 can get, I think 16 tons to lower Earth orbit, fully reusable, right? Landing it, landing back down. Uh, it could get 25 tons up if you wasted the, the first stage. Mm -hmm. um, but, in, and they're competing with United Launch Alliance, you know, they're, they're the, the, what, you know, the Atlas, as long as it keeps flying, it doesn't have that many flights left. And mm -hmm. the Vulcan at some point, if they ever get their engines. So right now, SpaceX is really the rocket company flying. Now, Blue Origin might get the new Glenn going, but again, they might not. There's something horribly wrong with the BE-4 engine. No one knows what it is, probably the turbo pump system. They're probably blowing up their turbo pumps. Who knows? But for whatever reason, they are way late getting those out, right? Yeah. So the company, United Launch Alliance, had the Vulcan ready to go, except for the engines. And now they've had to hire other companies to fulfill contracts they had. That's a bad business model, right? So that that's, I'm sure they're not super happy with Blue Origin right now being laid on those rocket engines. So when we look at the small satellite market, everyone wants to look at 100 tons to orbit, 200 tons to orbit. That's not really where the future of most of these flights are. Satellites are getting smaller and smaller. And what you used to have to do with 1,000 kilograms, you can now do with 100 or even less. I want to draw your attention to a company called Space Ride, R-Y-D-E, out of Canada. Space Ride is, uh, there's a gentleman with a doctorate of aerospace engineering. His name is uh, Saurabh Hagigat. Um, he had worked for Cruise, the self-driving car company. So he was brilliant at the algorithms to allow control, right? Your control theory, keeping things going where they're supposed to go. Now, he was an aerospace engineer, but he was hired by a car company because he's kind of a master of these algorithms. And he worked there for quite a while, did really well, uh, put some money back and decided to fulfill his dream, which is a space company. But his goal was to make money in space. So he's looking, how do we make money in space? So what they do is they take a hydrogen balloon on this giant drone carrier. This drone carrier floats up with the balloon to high altitude. Hmm. Then the drone orients the, the, the rocket deploying system in the direction it's supposed to go. Now, balloons with rockets had been tried since World War II. The problem was the things they're spinning, right? Because they always spin, balloons spin. And then you, rock the, you launch the thing and you're saying, okay, it's going one of 360 degrees. We'll see where, when, you know, when mm -hmm. it comes back down. Uh, you, or you could launch in the wrong direction. It would try to correct itself. These are not good options. But this thing... Because he had good experience with drone technology, he basically made a giant drone about the size of a small SUV. The rocket goes underneath it. This drone floats up, not trying to orient itself at first, but then when he turns it on, it will hold that thing in exactly the position it needs to be. Now you've done what Virgin Galactic does. For You don't, didn't have to build a giant airplane. You don't have pilots up there risking your lives. You just have a hydrogen balloon, super cheap. It then drops it. Two seconds later, the rocket ignites, and it's got a hybrid rocket engine similar to the, the uh, Virgin Galactic Launcher 1, and then goes into low Earth orbit. They're going to be doing this up to 150 kilograms for as low as a million dollars. Wow. Now we're talking business, because for every 100 ton something that needs to go to orbit, there's 101 ton things, 1,000. 0.1 ton things, right? 100 kilogram things. So there's a much bigger market. Now, the other thing that makes this company extremely competitive is that Canada has not had a launch capability yet. And mm -hmm. the government is very invested in getting that back. So they are working with this company. And if they, matter of fact, they've already been licensed to launch. And Space it's Ride. Space Ride. The first Canadian company in 21 years to get a launch license. Wow. So April of next year, they're going to be doing a test launch off the coast of, they launch from the east coast of Canada. And so they'll be, they'll, you know, they can do polar launches from there. And of course they can do, uh, you know, from that latitude, they can, you know, they, they can have that angle uh, as they go around, you know, as, as they launch something into low earth orbit because they can go over the, the Atlantic ocean. So they're okay there. Um, so, they have 
whereas it's Elon Musk's goal to colonize Mars. It's not his goal to make money, though he mm -hmm. has proven adept at that. Um, yep. He had to develop the technology to colonize Mars. And to do that, you've got to have some income. You've got to make some money. It cost him almost his entire $130 million to get a rocket working. So if you're looking to invest in the space industry, betting that someone will beat SpaceX is not a good bet at this point. Mm -hmm. But the companies that aren't competing with SpaceX, the, the small launch companies that will get your payload to exactly where it needs to go for a reasonable fee, because when you stack 30 satellites on a, a Falcon 9, they're all going to the same orbit. It doesn't matter where you wanted to be or when you wanted to launch. They're launching on this date and they're all going to the same orbit. <laughs> These little guys, including Astra, which has you know a, a good rocket system, and I think they will make it to space next time unless another something weird happens. I was very impressed with how robust their control system was because the thing walked itself yeah, out of the that. field and then climbed to orbit. I was, I, I thought that was beautiful. Um, Firefly, I think they'll make it. Next time, they simply had, you know, they've got electric pumps to pump the propellant. One of those came unplugged because of some uh, small combustion of, of, you know, leak propellants. It always happens. But anyway, they've they've rectified that issue, so I think they'll get to orbit next time. Um, these will be competitors for Rocket Lab as Rocket Lab is trying to step up the game and compete with SpaceX. Mm -hmm. So the smaller companies like that, there's another one I would draw your attention to, and this one is called Space Systems. But what they have is they have developed a reentry device. Mm -hmm. It is a reentry capsule, and they've been testing it. So you send your satellite up with your experiments. Let's say you have a 25 kilogram device that's going to spin you some low attenuation fiber optic, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to make you uh, maybe 10 kilometers or something of this stuff. This stuff is worth a lot because when you have fiber optics, you have to have repeater stations every so often because when fiber optic is formed on Earth, gravity creates these different layers, these laminations that interfere with the propagation of the light wave. When you're in zero gravity or free fall, it's perfect. You don't have mm -hmm. nearly as much of that. So it's called LAFO or low attenuation fiber optic. Um, made in space has an experiment on the International Space Station. They've already done. It works. They want to send stuff up. Well, you've got to get that stuff back, right? And you can't just go up like Blue Origin does and try to make it real fast and then drop back down. You've got like, you know, four minutes of zero G. So you need to go into orbit, low Earth orbit, maybe up for a week, and then get your stuff back. And your stuff at a million dollars a launch with Space Ride, and space systems um, is not super expensive for their reentry device. You can get your stuff back. So say it's a million up and a million down. If you've got something that's worth ten million once it's made in space, right? A, a, a perfect crystal or this low attenuation fiber optic. Three um, D printed organs are supposed to be. That's a exactly business what I was going to say. Yeah. That that is that market will be owned probably by SpaceX as they send up starships and- Oh, or, would you classify that as like the space applications business? Absolutely. It can only be done in zero gravity right now. Okay. Because the- There will be new industries built in space applications. We just don't even know all of the breadth of it, but- um, It will be like, like the transistor. We will find a thousand things done in space. As you hear people say, well, mining asteroids is useless because once you have the platinum, the value drops to nothing. Yeah. The value of what you can make with platinum does not drop to nothing. Mm -hmm. Platinum catalysts can dramatically decrease pollution, increase the efficiency of your electrolysis when you're trying to turn seawater into hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. They can, it's incredible what platinum can do. And the only reason that it's so expensive right now and people run off with your catalytic converter from your car is because it's outrageously expensive. So the products made in space of that platinum will be worth so much more than the platinum, uh, you know, as, as a jewelry would be, that it doesn't matter if the price of platinum plummets mm -hmm. when the product you make in space with that platinum is so valuable. Now, 3D printed organs is a very interesting thing. Um, that will require kind of like Sierra Nevada Corporation's space hotel or taking a, a spaceship up that's equipped to be kind of a space lab. 
okay. and, and making commercial stuff. The International Space Station is not really conducive. They don't really have the room. They're not really equipped for it. You know, the International Space Station, the widest of those modules uh, from the American side is 4.6 meters because that was the width of the space shuttle cargo bay. Mm -hmm. right? And even with the Soviet ones, well, Russian now, they, they were limited by what a proton or a Soyuz rocket could get up to orbit. So those are not really big when you look at, you know, everything packed in. You know, they're in a pretty small environment. When you look at a starship, if they can get one of those things into orbit, orbit, or something like a Bigelow 330, you know, B330, yeah. or a Sierra Nevada, you know, their inflatable habitat, those floating laboratories where a company can send their experiment up and scientists on hand will carry out the industrial experiment or the industrial process and send it back on a dream chaser or a dragon capsule or whatever. Now you're talking real industry. Mm. And of course, it will start off with, with things like organs, which, you know, each one is worth millions of dollars. It's your own kidney. When you get a t kidney transplant today, you're, you're condemning yourself to a lifetime of immunosuppressive drugs that will, over time, shorten your life. Now, you'll get another 10 to 15 years right now, which is great. If you're 30 years old and you need a kidney, 45 sounds a lot better than 32. Yeah. But they will be able to do a liposuction, turn your adipose cells into stem cells, 3D print you a new kidney, let it grow to maturity in orbit so that it can survive re-entry and won't, you know, right now the gravity just merges everything together and drains it. So in zero gravity, these things will mature to where they can withstand a few G-forces. They'll bring it back down, put it in, and that is your kidney. And there will be no rejection. There will be no immunity medications. And it's cheaper for, you know, countries with socialized medicine like Europe to replace your kidney with, with your stem cells, even if it involves sending it into space and paying a million dollars than it is to keep you on those immunosuppressive drugs and dialysis and everything else it's going to take to keep you alive. So long term, the potential for space industry is unbelievable. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. what were you going to say, Matt? Yeah, I was just going to say, so, you know, th this is all really incredible. So th thank, thank you so much for sharing your, your information. Um, you know, as, as investors, I think one of the things we're trying to do is to, you know, kind of match up the technical capabilities of all these companies with their valuations today, and then looking ahead to kind of where, you know, the, the applications are going to be in the future. Um, you know, and so as I'm trying to, you know, segment all these different companies out in my own head, I'm comparing their market cap, of, of course, just to get a, a read on price. But then I'm looking at a company like Virgin Galactic, um, you know, which has technology that doesn't seem like it can kind of make the next step to, to low earth orbit. I mean, it's, it's highly complex, you know, like aircraft essentially that's, you know, got a rocket attached to it and, you know, has a lot, a lot of mechanical controls for all points of failure. Um, and, and I don't see, you know, kind of the appetite to dig into, you know, the, the broader market with a bigger total addressable market. Um, you know, looking at what rocket lab is doing today, you know, they, they've got that, um, uh, that flight heritage, which I know is so important to a lot of satellite providers. Um, and then at the same time, one of the things that I think differentiates them, um, even from like a, a Falcon 9 it, a launch, is, is the fact that they've got that kick stage, which can be, you know, relit so many times. And you can kind of take these very small satellite providers and, and you know, get a host of them together onto, you know, that second stage and place them into individual orbits. Um, it's so, like the ride sharing, they call it, right? Yeah, right, exactly. So, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, like, Paul, from, from your perspective, how important is that capability today to provide value to um, customers relative to what SpaceX is offering, you know, with its ride share program on Falcon 9? Uh, and then from there, maybe we can go into some some other kind of how that develops over time with, with the Neutron and, and with some of the stuff that SpaceX is doing. Maybe we can maybe try to fast forward five years and, and see how these companies develop. Yeah, I mean, with the whole rideshare thing, I mean, Rocket Lab is taking on a market that SpaceX doesn't tackle just because uh, their payload to orbit is so much higher with a Falcon 9. Uh, like Joseph mm -hmm. said earlier, you know, all your all your deployment, all your payload is going to a particular orbit, whereas mm -hmm. with the Photon, you can literally launch CubeSats in all different types of orbits. It may take a little time, but 
being a dedicated launch provider, you are still getting to your orbit a lot faster than a ride share, a traditional ride share. Um, and you mentioned, you know, Virgin Galactic again. Yeah, I mean, when we're looking at these companies to invest in, we want to find a company that um, has technology that scales to a bigger TAM, right? So like mm -hmm. you mentioned with Virgin Galactic, their biggest selling point for a long term to really fill into their market cap is that point to point travel and using their existing technology like their hybrid engine that burns for about a minute um, isn't going to get them there. Their their way of getting up above the atmosphere with um, uh, what is it? Their white knight, I believe it's called. I mean, that's not going to scale to point to point. Um, and then you look at, for example, Blue Origin and they're using uh, New Shepard. You would love to see a lot of technology from New Shepard transferred to New Glenn. And um, it's amazing that they haven't gone with like a smaller orbital vehicle before jumping to New Glenn, because that is a very, very difficult engineering challenge that they've chosen to take on because they've never taken any vehicle to orbital velocities before. So they don't know, you know, you can have theory and simulation, but um, until you actually see those thermal loads and and cut into you know your your heat shield to see what kind of damage is done you just don't know um so yeah, yeah that's I mean, actually one of the things that peter peter beck was saying you know that they were not trying to to land their first stage for the longest time and then eventually they, they decided to give it a try and what what peter was saying which i found so interesting is they they basically put their first stage in the worst possible return trajectory just to see how that um you know, re-entry would, would really damage the vehicle. And then they could cut it open, like you're saying, Paul, and kind of examine, okay, where, you know, how much wear and tear did this sustain? And what can we learn from that as, as we kind of, uh, you know, engineer other solutions, not only for, you know, the Electron first stage, which they are trying to, you know, reuse now, uh, but, you know, also as, they, as they're going into, you know, larger launch vehicles, you know, they're going to be able to apply those learnings uh, that they have the best possible knowledge on because it, it's not like a model, uh, but they're going to be able to uh, employ those learnings into their future vehicles as well. So I, I completely agree with you that it's it's going to be a huge challenge for Blue Origin. Yeah. Not only are they kind of jumping the gun, I would bet more on Rocket Lab than I would Blue Origin at this point. Um, throwing things into orbit and watching them come back is the only way you learn how to do these things. Um, Rocket Lab did not try to make something reusable because that's extremely difficult. So they made, tried to make it affordable if you threw it away. Then they say, drop it with a parachute, catch it with a helicopter, which everyone thinks is brand new, but the military has been doing it forever, right? You've got to find a technology somebody thought of, proved it worked, but isn't currently being used in your industry, right? Hyperloop was designed in the 1920s by the American father of rocket science, you know, Goddard. Um, Elon Musk didn't, you know, think of it or invent it. He just looked at it and said, yeah, somebody should do that. This is feasible now. Mm -hmm. um, rocket Lab is doing the same thing. Photon is probably the most innovative thing Rocket Lab has. There's lots of ways to get things into orbit, but nobody said, bring us your satellite, your payload. And we've got this modular satellite bus. And we'll stick your experiment on there and your satellite on there and we'll send it wherever you want. We take care of that for you. Hmm. All right. Everybody else, you have to custom build a satellite bus. So far, we have been going to the grocery store with satellite, uh, with satellites, with Ferraris and Lamborghinis, custom hand built Bugattis, beautiful cars. The SLS is a perfect example of this, mm -hmm. right? In, in lots of ways, it's a beautiful system. It's hydrogen powered, the highest specific impulse. It, it uses the space shuttle main tank and then the four little rock. But we're spending billions to do this. And the Soviets succeeded at exactly the same thing in the 1980s. They had a big hydrogen tank, exactly like ours. Engines underneath it, exactly like what we're trying to do. And they used RP-1 boosters on the side instead of solid rocket boosters. And they did it. They had, were able to get 100 tons to orbit, All right? So we've got Blue Origin struggling to get maybe 65 tons to low Earth orbit to start with, with the new Glenn. Um, we've got now SpaceX, the Starship, the difference between the Starship and everyone else, bringing a booster back and making it reusable is not that hard, right? Now, it is, but realistically, with modern computer systems and control systems and everything, that only took SpaceX, what, a decade of crashing them into drone ships, persistence. But now they're landing dependably. 
And if one didn't land, we would all say, oh, he blew the landing. How did that happen? Whereas just 10 years ago, we were all saying, my God, he landed one. And then when the two came down next to each other from the Falcon Heavy, that was a historical moment. That was Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic. That was everyone saying, oh, this isn't just possible. He made it look easy. He landed two of them. And yeah. so what is innovative about Starship is that the second stage will be reusable. The first stage goes up maybe 60 to 80 kilometers. Most Falcon 9s uh, separate at about 84 kilometers. Mm -hmm. right? So that's almost to space. But you're only at about 3 to 3.5 kilometers per second. You've got to generate almost 9.5 kilometers per second to get to a stable low Earth orbit with an orbital velocity of 7.8 7 kilometers per second. So the first stage is not in orbit ever. It, go, it gets everything up above the atmosphere and it gets up there and gets you a little lateral velocity because it's done the pitch over and then it drops away. Now the second stage adds the last two thirds. It's the one that goes from 3.5 kilometers per second to 7.5 kilometers per second. Touching the atmosphere at 7.5 kilometers per second. So once you're in low Earth orbit, right, there you are. You're up there orbiting. It only takes about 400 meters per second delta V change to bring you down to touch that atmosphere. But you're going so fast that the air turns to plasma. And what mm -hmm. do we call oxygen plasma? A cutting torch, right? Mm -hmm. That's all a cutting torch is, is hot oxygen being sprayed onto something with some acetylene to keep it burning and then pure oxygen. So you have a cutting torch the size of whatever is touching the atmosphere. Yeah, huge. That, so bringing back a second stage is extremely hard. So in the past, they put on these big heat shields that burn away and ablate, and they're not reusable, right? Orion will, re, will redo the heat shield and it'll be reusable. The Dragon capsules are reusable because they redo the heat shields. But then again, SpaceX redid the whole, you know, the, the, the whole heat shield material. They made it cheaper, better, easier to apply. They put like six engineers on it. Not a huge team. Didn't take yeah. a decade. They took six engineers and said, make this better. And they did. So the Dragon capsule has the best heat shield in the world right now. Um, so, but Starship will be a reusable second stage. Now you've completely shifted the goalposts. Everyone else is struggling to catch up with a reusable first stage. <laughs> yeah. You've got the Russian set. We've got the Angora rocket. And by 2030, we're going to land one of those boosters back. So that's mm -hmm. great. But by 2030, SpaceX will have been doing that for 20 years. And they'll <laughs> have these big silver starships coming back to land. So you're not, you're not competing. Right now, in, in the large launch market, SpaceX has no peer and no competition. And others, uh, even national projects, you know, the European Space Union with their Ariane 5, Ariane 6, China, they're hoping to catch up, but they're mm -hmm. nowhere near it. They're just yeah. starting to race while the other guy is having a drink of water about a kilometer from the finish line on the marathon. So competing in the large launch market is going to be very tough. But things like Photon that Paul brought up, that's innovative. That's mm -hmm. different. People yeah. will buy that because that thing will take me where I don't want to design a satellite bus. I just want my satellite to go up and do my experiment and come back down. Now, the coming back down thing is going to be very, very important. And that's where a little this reentry company that I was looking at, as far as I can tell, they're the only company with a certified reentry system that has that, you know, is successful. And they've got different sizes for different size payloads. So I look for companies that are doing something that are providing a niche that's not nearly as as uh, inspiring as seeing Starship on the launch pad, yeah. but is an excellent business opportunity. Yeah, because you can't bring things back. You know, it's like it's, the hotel providers, the people who sell the shovels at the you know exactly. like going to the gold. That's exactly. Rush. And so, and just talking a little bit more about the total addressable market, Matt. I don't know if you still have the screen uh, of the total addressable market on rocket launches uh, presentation. But the launch services, which, you know, SpaceX clearly can dominate, um, it seems like Rocket Lab is, you know, put on their uh, presentation that, you know, it's like a 10 billion a year addressable market um, by the end of the decade or as we go on. And then they put these other categories that we've sort of touched on a little bit um, as much bigger, bigger ones. I think it was the space systems or space applications. Um, yeah. You can you, can you see my screen now? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. I, so I'm gonna click on to make it bigger here. I'll click to make it bigger. I don't know if you guys can click to make it bigger too, but I can see it if I make it bigger. Yeah, now I see it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, we, yeah. we thought this was a, a really kind of interesting. This is from Rocket Labs um, Investor Day presentation not too long ago. Um, you know, but but they were talking about kind of the, the total addressable market of, of each one of these, you know, market segments and essentially how, how their strategy is to kind of grow from launch with a, a TAM of only 10 billion to the space systems, um, you know, uh, photon and such yeah. photon. Yeah. Uh, which has, you know, a, a TAM that's twice as large. Uh, but even that's not particular, particularly interesting at 20 billion dollars. And when, you know, launch costs are going to be coming down. So so I think the thing that gets us excited about uh, as investors is this, you know, space applications TAM that's $320 billion. Um, and even that, I mean, it could change over time. I mean, like you were saying with the platinum example, I mean, it, there, there's so many um, applications that could provide value in ways that you can't even really, you know, project right now. Um, we kind of view the entire market as, as very likely to um, increase by, you know, leaps and bounds as this, this TAM becomes realized over the next decade. And there's going to be room for many winners, we think. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, kind of your, your thoughts on, on what, um, what uh, Rocket Lab may be doing in this space application space, seeing as that's kind of the, the end goal, um, you know, for, for the company, I think, as uh, from, from a value creation perspective. Um, Peter Beck, I think, has been very mum with the details uh, on what exactly, what type of services they aim to be providing from space back to Earth. Uh, but here we get a little bit of a clue where they say, you know, they're going to be uh, demand for space-based space -based connectivity, Earth observation, including synthetic aperture, radar, electro-optical, and RF, and other services. So, you know, I think the the, the parallel here would be to a company or to uh, like Starlink and what they're doing with with providing, you know, space-based internet services here on Earth. But what types of services do, do you both think uh, Rocket Lab could be aiming to provide? Um, you know, with this little teaser of information that they've given us here. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, well, one thing to know before we get into that is uh, their launch business is required to get their space systems business up into yeah. orbit. And then their space systems business enables the space application. So it's great that mm -hmm. they're monetizing like their launch business right now. But like one flows into two, which flows into three. So they need mm -hmm. one because otherwise they'd be relying on someone else to launch their their photon satellites. It doesn't work any other way. Um, so it's great that they, they, they monetize along the way. And, you know, space systems, like we said, they're selling their different uh, hardware uh, used for satellites like reaction wheels and star trackers. So they're real monetizing. Quick, each real, real quick, Paul, yeah. what are reaction wheels? I don't even really know. Like, is it a wheel of some sort? Just before I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just curious. I know people have heard that news, but what? specifically is a reaction wheel and then i'd love you to continue sorry to interrupt though no yeah, yeah. so uh when you think about a satellite in orbit the way mm -hmm. that it controls its attitude which way it's facing it mm -hmm. needs an attitude control system so reaction wheels are a way of storing momentum and releasing momentum so if a spacecraft wants to roll a certain way they have these reaction wheels that are literally just like massive wheels that are spooled up at a certain rpm and they will spin a reaction wheel in a certain direction and conservation of momentum will say that your spacecraft will spin in the opposite direction to conserve momentum. So you normally have a reaction mm -hmm. wheel for X, Y, and Z axis, and maybe uh, one that's angled for redundancy. Um, but it's just a way of, of moving and orienting your spacecraft, your satellite, uh, wherever that you want to aim it, whether you have a okay. pointing requirement for like a Earth observation requirement um but yeah reaction so every wheels satellite needs reaction wheels of some sort would you say they every, need every orbiting mechanism machine sort of needs reaction wheels well, of some sort. i should say everyone yeah. needs that function but okay. magnet torquers can do it for tiny stuff okay picture a 45 pound weight plate spinning so we make a spaceship we, we take a uh what do you call those things an airstream we take one of those beautiful airstream trailers and we shrink wrap it with a good plastic and we launch it up on a, on a you know, starship and it's in orbit. Yeah. I've got a 45 pound plate from my gym sitting there with an electric motor on it. If I start spinning that thing, mm -hmm. the motor is connected to my airstream. And as I start spinning it this way, 
the airstream starts rotating in the opposite direction in proportion to the mass and the angular momentum, and he understands that stuff better than I do. But you spin it one way, and your ship starts moving the other way. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, you slow it down to make your ship stop. So without expending propellant, you can change the orientation of your ship. Now, you're not going to be moving it forward or backwards or stuff like that. That requires the expulsion of mass. But you can make it roll, pitch, and yaw any way you want. And so they get three of these pointing in different directions, and you can, you've got your X, Y, and Z, and you can, you can control your ship. All right. So what SpaceX proved better than any other company that's ever come before is that you don't have to sub, sub, sub contract. Build your own stuff, and you get to keep the money. Yeah. All right. So SpaceX was looking at space computers. What computers do we put on our rocket? And well, everyone's been using this company. They've been in business since the Apollo days, and it's only $20 million per computer. It's an 8088 chip. And you're saying, 8088 chip, you know, that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's ancient technology. Why don't I just buy three new computers, and if one gets toasted by cosmic rays, the other two are very unlikely to suffer the same deficit and save myself a lot of money. And that's exactly what they did, and it turned out to be very smart. And actually, modern computers turned out to be pretty robust. Mm. You know, they, they, they turned out to be fairly resistant. Now, you'll get – Tom. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul can probably – Tom. Paul can probably – explain the error correction analysis they do with these computers so that if you know they've got a triple redundant system and if one detects an error the other computers can tell that their buddy's going crazy and they ignore that input so there's algorithms that do all this but it is so much cheaper so rocket lab is trying to do exactly what spacex did we're buying reaction wheels for our photon system right Reaction wheels are darn expensive from our supplier. Let's make our, make our own cheaper and better. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Paul? Yeah, I mean, one of the best parts about Rocket Lab is they are so vertically integrated. Like, they were trying to buy a TPS, a thermal protection system, and a heat shield, and the protective layers were just so expensive. You know, Peter Beck was like, "We we cannot afford this. We have to make it ourselves." And they've done that with so many different things across their platforms. Um, the photon satellite was announced like almost four years ago mm-hmm. and it's, it's flown basically every single mission. They have that flight heritage now, and that puts them so far ahead of so many other competitors where, you know, they always say, or Peter Beck always mentions a lot of these, uh, providers that are trying to launch their sensors into space to provide data. They don't want to make a satellite because that's, that's not their expertise. It's, there's a lot of risk involved with building the whole satellite bus and, putting that whole platform. So if, if Rocket Lab is able to build this robust system of proton satellites that they can customize for each mission and take care of all that work so you can just plug and play your sensor, I mean, that's a huge market that they're able to capitalize on. Yeah, and before I had us go on that tangent of reaction, was you were sort of getting into like the, the bigger total adjustable market, Paul. I don't know if you remember what your train of thought there, sorry to interrupt, but what were you kind of saying about like, you know, they first had to do the launch services then the space services, and the space applications, like what, what were you saying there? Yeah, so from a high level, you get the launch taken care of so that you're launching whatever you need into space. Once you have, for example, a lot of protons, they're able to build their own kind of constellation in space. Once you have a constellation, then you have that connectivity and you can start providing data. And there's so many applications. I mean, you know, you said, uh, Matt, you're saying Peter Beck's been pretty vague about it. Well, that's because there's so many applications once you have that connectivity, whether it's for military applications, you could have like a a missile Mm -hmm. uh, defense layer where you're tracking, you know, ICBMs launched from North Korea or China, and you have, uh, you know, that instant connectivity for defense reasons. Mm -hmm. There's uh, telecommunication, there's uh so many so many applications but once you have that constellation then i mean that is a huge money maker high margins and that's where uh rock lab can really grow into a large valuation long term yeah and so, so i think so I'm, I'm, i was sorry i mean i was, I was gonna say go you know, i'm curious of the three you know that they actually listed you know synthetic aperture radar electro optical and rf you know, are there any um, like specific examples or, or, you know, things that you guys could try to translate that into into English for, for folks who maybe aren't, uh, you know, as as well versed in some of the technical terms? Like how, how could those specific uh, capabilities translate to service services provided to Earth? That man worked for the National Reconnaissance Office. So I uh, 
<laughs> I yield the floor. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> um, I mean, when it comes down to, you know, there, when you look up in the sky, there's only so much you can see from a visual, you know, uh, spectrum. What we can see with our own naked eyes. But the truth is there is so much connectivity going on from different frequencies that we can't see. And, you know, once you have that connectivity, you can track into things that are monitoring, uh, whether it's heat, heat signatures, whether it's uh, communication, um, whether it's weather patterns. Uh, so there's a lot of capability in terms of predicting weather, um, in terms of predicting uh, missile defense threats, like I mentioned earlier, and just mm -hmm. boosting connectivity to regions of the world, kind of like um, Starlink's doing with their internet. I mean, there's different ways that you can do that, again, with different constellations. And the more connected the world is, the more efficient you can be as well. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of applications that can be uh, performed once they have that connectivity. One of them is agriculture. So you've got all these fields. Uh, you've got these soybean fields, rice fields, wheat, corn. And you can either put out a million sensors to tell you where water's, you know, disappearing too deep into the soil to be used by the plants. Or you can fly over with a satellite that can see in the infrared and it tells you, hey, this corner of your field's dry and you mm -hmm. can turn up the irrigation there. Eventually, these systems will be automatic to where the, 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 the watering, the, 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 the fertilizer placement and everything will be optimized. And then you save on fertilizer, you save on water, you get a higher yield of crop. We're talking trillions of dollars from having access to space. Um, just just the agricultural applications, and that's where you see a lot of infrared and forestry and stuff like that. Yeah, forestry um, wildfires here in California, maybe those could be more accurately and quickly they, reported. They could be spotted immediately. Since the 1990s, well, since the 1980s, actually, we've had the SPADATS system, the, the space detection and tracking system. So if something launches in Russia, that infrared heat bloom is picked up within a matter of minutes, well, seconds, the trajectory calculated in a matter of minutes, and that is relayed to NORAD amazingly fast. That type of technology can be used to tell us when a wildfire has started, before it's so big that it takes, you know, five states to put it out. Yeah. So if you had a rapid response team, and they, you know, California's got para, you know, uh, the, the paratroop, uh, para dropping firefighters, whatever they call them, um, those guys could be dropped strategically fast enough to get the job done. So you're not spending millions. You could also say this area of the forest has gotten way too dry. Let's have a controlled burn. Mm -hmm. But doing that on the ground is extremely expensive and almost impossible. Doing that from space is not difficult at all with modern AI and the type of visualizing systems that you have. 